Wow, look at that. There's more people here this morning than last night. I didn't chase everybody away. Um, so you know who I am. I'm Robert Carter. I happen to be a scientist, but the most important part of my life is that I'm a Christian. And I've tried very hard throughout my adult life to take those two things and blend them together without compromising the Christian part. It's not always easy. There's a lot of challenges in science, a huge challenges in science. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the thing called the Y chromosome, the thing that makes men men, the little piece of DNA that we carry that ladies don't carry. We're going to talk about um, Adam in the Bible, the first male ever, the only male ever, the male who all of men in the world have inherited a little piece of DNA. We're going to take a little bit about the mitochondria, which is something that's traced only through females. That goes back to Eve. We're going to do some easy things and some complicated things. I'm going to try to mix it up to try to give everyone something to take, take home. But I need to establish the fact that I'm actually a geneticist. I mean, I'm out there with my little machine measuring the sun, right? I'm not a stellar astronomer. I'm, um, uh, last night, I talked a lot of philosophy. I'm not a philosopher. I'm actually a geneticist. I started off at the University of Miami studying corals, these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful animals. And as I'm working on them and I'm have them in my laboratory, I'm growing them, I'm, I'm cutting them up and, and, and extracting things out of them, trying to figure out what makes them tick. I'm looking at their colorations. I'm trying to figure out what these colors are made of. Because when you look at a human, the colors of humans, the, the various shades of brown and maybe blue eyes, which is really just really, really, really light brown. But that's caused by something called melanin. And we look at dogs and cats and cows and horses, that's different sh uh, types of melanin that causes those colorations. Well, these guys glow under a black light. And I thought it was going to be a chemical. But as I'm doing extractions, nothing worked until I did a protein extraction. And lo and behold, I had this, this goo in the bottom of a test tube, which was bright green. I said, that's protein? Because I'm made of proteins, and I don't glow under a black light. But they do. But here's where it gets sticky. Because once I realized that there's a protein behind it, I knew there's a gene behind it. And once I realized there's a gene behind it, I managed to steal that gene and engineer it into these animals. So I made the frankenfish. My doctor is actually in genetic engineering. Totally by accident. I stumbled right into the field. It was an amazing place to be. Now, the question comes up, are we allowed to do this? Can we monkey around with God's creation? Are we allowed to take genes from one type of animal and shove them into genes of another type of animal? Those are questions that we have to ask every time we go to the grocery store now. <laughs> Those are questions we have to ask every time we go to the doctor's office. Most medicines are grown in yeast or E. coli that's been engineered to carry a gene to produce something. So genetic engineering is in our lives. We can't help it. But in my laboratory, we were working on cancer models. We wanted to get that gene next, the, the protein for the fluorescent color gene next to a gene that only turns on when the animal had cancer. So the tumor would be colored. And we cured it, that tumor would stop being colored. It would be a reporter gene for cancer. And so honestly, sacrificing the lives of a few fish in order to save a few human lives is a noble endeavor. And I was very proud to be there. But there are definitely laboratories at that university that I would not have wanted to walk into the doors of because I know what they were experimenting on, and I knew where they got their cell lines from. There are moral questions here, and it's a very treacherous area. Science is difficult, and science has a moral component to it, and Christians, we need to acknowledge that. And sometimes we have this, like, you know, knee-jerk reaction against things when really we should approach it more soberly, so, okay, there's good and bad, and then advocate for the government to not be evil. But, well, okay, we're not talking about politics. <laughs> A lot of what I'm going to present this whole weekend has already appeared in the pages of our Creation Magazine. Much of what I'm presenting is already on our website, creation.com. So if you have a question when we're done, just go to those places and, and look stuff up and feed yourself. I can't answer all your questions. There's no way I can answer your questions. Creation.com, it's a really hard website to remember. Um, and it's there for you. We've got, I mean, 12 or 13,000 articles on that website. We've been writing for 46 years. If there's a question, we've probably answered it. But something else we do is every Friday, we send out an, an email to the people on our list. I mean, it goes out to a couple hundred thousand people. 
it's um, something new, something informative. Very often we'll have um, a brand new scientific you know, paper comes out and the world's talking about this great evidence revolution. We'll say, no, it's not. So we'll have one of our people write an article and we put it on our website. And so with just a couple of days, you'll get an email in your box with an answer to that thing you just might have heard. It's a great way to stay on top of what we do. If you'd like to get our email, um, we're going to pass this around while I'm speaking. If you don't want it, no big deal. Just pass it to the next person. But we ask for a name and email address and a zip code. And the zip code is only there because when we send a speaker out on the road, we email everyone within a certain radius. Says, hey, come on. And there's probably people here today that got our email. Just thank you for coming. So those are going around now. Thank you, guys. And we're talking about a very important portion of Scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. How does that differ from everything else that God created? Everything else God created, he just spoke it into existence. Let there be, and it was so. But not in this case. In this case, he stopped. He came down. He took dirt. He fashioned it into a human, and he breathed the Spirit into Adam's nostrils. That's a very intimate thing. Humans are very important to God. I don't know why, but we just are. In one sense, you might say that God created the universe in order for humans to exist so that he could send his son down to die for those humans so that we could live forever in heaven. That's interesting. But looking at Adam, this very important figure, this one man, Adam, from whom all people today are descended. But he also created a woman. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman. This is why men have one less rib than women. Good, thank you. No, of course not. That's ridiculous. That's not true. Um, think about it, right? If I, if I lost my finger to an ax, my children are still going to have ten fingers, right? Okay. Um, plus, the, the rib is a bone that will regrow. Surgeons will take pieces of rib bone to do reconstructive surgeries and go back to that same rib again later and that same rib again later. And we know that because the founder of of CMI, Dr. Carl Wieland, was involved in a head-on tractor-trailer accident in the middle of the outback in Australia. And he had about 17 surgeries. The man essentially had no face. They had to rebuild what he looked like from his rib. One, again, and it kept on taking the rib out, and it kept on regrowing. So I'm just putting that out there for you. So the Bible claims very clearly there's one man who founded all of humanity and one female who founded all of humanity, and Eve is a descendant of Adam. We got that, right? That's what that says? Why do so many people not believe it? Why do so many Christians not believe it? Men like Francis Collins, who was the head of the National Institutes of Health under Obama, and under Trump, he just retired. Well, he wrote a book a while back, and Christianity Today featured this book in an article called The Search for the Historical Adam. And they write, Collins is, oh, by the way, uh, Francis Collins claims to be an evangelical Christian. Now follow what he says. Collins' 2006 bestseller, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief, reported scientific indications that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors perhaps 100,000 years ago. What? Long before the Genesis time frame. Huh? And originated with a population number something like 10,000, not two individuals. So if the scientist is presenting evidence for belief, all the evidence he's presenting is straight-up evolutionary theory. That's the out-of-Africa theory. That's what that is. So how does that support the Bible? How does that support his faith? You might have heard of um, William Lane Craig, a famous Christian apologist. Um, I've done amazing work over the years. I've been blessed by a lot of things this man has written. But he thinks the earth is millions of years old and he believes in evolution. Well, knowing that, he was in a debate with an atheist named Frank Zindler. He ran a big atheist organization in America. Again, back in 96... And um, Bill Craig got stuck because this is all Zindler had to say. He knew that 
Dr. Craig did not believe in Adam and Eve. And he says, if there's never an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a Savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. My friends, if you get rid of the first Adam, there's no need for the last Adam. The atheists have known that at least back to the time of Charles Darwin. We have all the letters he wrote to his friends and the friends wrote to him. They knew that formula. So there are deep theological and spiritual implications of how we treat Adam and Eve, right? So what is it? Did Adam really live or did we come out of monkeys? Now, most of you are like, oh, yeah, no, evolution is true. Yeah, we Adam and Eve, but... How do you answer that in light of all the scientific evidence? That's what we're about to get into. Hold on to your hats. There are great arguments for Adam. I'm going to go through seven of them. One, my first best evidence for, on the list for a reason to believe in the biblical Adam is population growth. I pulled this off the, um, the uscensus.gov website. This is an estimate of population size going back to 10,000 B.C., Notice the incredible spike in population size over the last two or 3,000 years. That's huge. But you know what the funny thing is? There's no evidence for that earlier time period. They estimate there's about a million people alive for a couple hundred thousand years. But if the average generation time is, you know, maybe 25, maybe 30 years, that means on average you'd have a million dead bodies every 25 to 30 years. How many dead bodies would be generated in 100,000 years? Where are all the dead bodies? Where are the graves? Where are the cities? Where is the evidence of a billion or more people in the archaeological record? It's not there. It's as if the people never lived. But wait a minute. There's 8 billion people on earth today. How can you start, not from Adam and Eve, but from Shem, Ham, and Japheth after the flood? That's only 4,500 or so years ago. How do you go from them and their wives, that's six people, to eight billion people in only four and a half thousand years? How do you do that? Isn't that crazy? Actually, no. If you just take that population and double it every 150 years, I'm assuming there's some families in this room who have more than two children. Uh, It is easy to double a population trivial easy. Now, so 150, so he had the flood. 150 years later, if there's 12 people, we're on track. If 300 years later, there's only 24 people, we're on track. If 450 years later, there's 48 people, we're still on track. If you keep doubling that every 150 years, you'll arrive at the number of people alive today. So population growth is trivial And it directly supports the biblical account because the archaeological evidence for millions upon millions of people in the distant past isn't there. It's as if we really did start 4,500 years ago. You okay with that? Number two. When we look at the Y chromosome in men, I'll explain what that is in a moment, there's an incredible lack of diversity. All men across the planet clearly came from a single ancestor a short time ago. Now, how long ago? That's a, model of, a matter of modeling and statistics and, and scientific estimates. I mean, it's really hard to pin it down, but all we know is it wasn't long ago. Now, what's a chromosome? If you take a photograph of a human cell when it's dividing, the chromosomes are condensed. And you can put a stain in there that will stain the DNA. You take a photograph, then you can cut the chromosomes out and line them up. It's called a karyotype. Is a very important method for diagnosing uh, several different types of birth defects, Down syndrome being the classic one, when one of the arms of one of the chromosomes gets copied and translocated to another chromosome. So it's a little bit longer, and you can see it under a microscope. But if you look at all the chromosomes in our cells, which are made of DNA, you'll notice they come in pairs. We have two copies of chromosome one. Now, chromosome one is no joke, this long. One molecule in your body, and you have two of them, is that long. 
and it's packed into a, the, into a nucleus that you can't even see with the naked eye. In fact, if you put all your DNA together, it's six feet long inside every one of your cells. So already we understand God is an engineer because he figured out how to pack all that material into a cell. That's crazy. But if you look at these pairs, one, two, three, four, five, all the way down to the end, you notice that the last two in this individual aren't paired. He has one long chromosome and one short chromosome. The long chromosome is called the X chromosome. The short one is called the Y chromosome. If you have a long X chromosome and a short Y chromosome, that's what makes you a man. Females, women, have two X chromosomes. Now, I remember being in college, and I was taught the Y chromosome is a vestigial piece of DNA. It's not needed. It only has a couple of genes on it. It's useless. One day, it'll just be deleted entirely because males are superfluous. It's very strange. But that was definitely taught. Y chromosomes are, are degenerate. And it's true. There's only a couple of genes on there. And there's a lot of really repetitive sequences in the Y chromosome. But there's one particular gene called the SRY gene. If you carry that gene, it acts as a master control switch and affects the genetic expression of thousands of genes on all of the other chromosomes. It's not vestigial at all. It's like, um, you know the old-timey electric switches that had the two knives and the big thing, you go kaplonk like that? You know those things? It's a knife switch. It's a giant knife switch. And when that thing is thrown, everything changes. That's why men and women are not the same. We don't look the same. We don't act the same. We don't think the same. It's this little teeny thing. And most of what it does, it affects testosterone expression. Women, you do produce testosterone. Men just produce a lot more. And it makes us larger. It makes us more aggressive. It makes us more susceptible to some cancers over others. And it starts being dosed in the womb. Hence, Talking a little bit of a PG subject here. You know how the world is going crazy right now with sexuality? You can't give a child chemicals to stop puberty and change their, I don't want, there's children in the room, I don't want to say things too loud, but that doesn't work because the males have already been dosed with testosterone since they were an embryo. That's why they grow different. That's why when they come out, they look different, right? They have different parts because of testosterone. So, the Y chromosome is really important. But we can now sequence the DNA in the Y chromosome. It took a long time to do. It was really hard to do. But we can sequence the DNA. It's 65 million letters long. A lot of it's really hard to sequence. So they usually focus on about 10 million letters. And those 10 million letters have been sequenced in thousands, now hundreds of thousands, now actually a couple of million men in this world. We have a really good idea of Y chromosome diversity. And if we take all that DNA and line it up, we can build a family tree based on how similar those, those sequences are. So I did that. I made this tree using an evolutionary tree modeling program. Now, this is amazing. I could spend an hour just talking about this one picture because there's history here and there's culture here. For example, most of you Men belong to group R1B. That is the most common Y chromosome in Western Europe. Native Americans belong to group Q. People in India, Pakistan, that area, a lot of them have R1A. You ever notice, do you know that some of the languages in the East are very similar to the Western European languages? Like Hindi is very similar to French. It, they're in the Indo-European language family. And they're in group R1 in the Y chromosome. Because there was an ancient population that split and some went west and some went east. And we have a common heritage. But notice Native Americans are more closely related to those people than they are to, say, Chinese people. Most of whom are in group O. But you see this fan? See that beautiful fan shape in group O? That is something that happens in a population that grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Small populations, people die. And a lot of the branches in the family tree go extinct. 
So in a small population, you get leggy branches with long branches. These are the, uh, the Khoisan Bushmen, group A1, that live in the Kalahari Desert in Africa. The people that when they're talking, they're in their language. I mean, I can't even pretend to do it. I love listening to them. It's like all of a sudden this weird thing pops and you don't even know where it comes from. Those are those people here. The, the pygmies that live in the Central African rainforests are here. But most Africans are here in group E1B1A. 90, 95% of African males. But look, they all go back to a single root. They go back to a single founding male who lived not that long ago. But E1B1B, they live in North Africa and out of Africa, and E and B and D and Group C. Genghis Khan belonged to Group C, the Mongolian warlord. But that means that if these Africans branch off from non-Africans and they branch off from non-Africans and they branch off from non-Africans, these Africans arose outside of Africa and then invaded and took over. Oh, that's cool. This is parts of history that we don't know because nothing's written down. Across the world, for the thousands of years in a lot of places, no one wrote down any history. And so now we can go back and see the history in the genes, and it's really amazing. You go to Papua New Guinea, we'll find men who belong on maybe group D and other men who belong to group N and K and S, which means that whoever founded Papua New Guinea, two totally different branches on the family tree arrived on that island. And you can't look at the men and tell. Say, so, oh, you're, though, you belong to Ham and you belong to Japheth. You can't do that. This is so fascinating. I, I literally, I could, I could keep on talking and talking and talking, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to draw a circle around the majority of the men. That circle represents about 200 mutations, 200 letter differences from the center to the edges. What if I told you there's been about 200 uh, generations in all of human history? from Adam till today, 150 to 200 generations. And what if I told you that the average mutation rate is about one per, one per generation in the Y chromosome? That's a biblical time scale, not the evolutionary time scale. We can have all of this diversity appear in humans in biblical time. We don't need evolutionary time to explain this. In fact, the evolutionists are the ones, they have to slow down the mutation rate to ridiculously slow levels. The mutation rate we can measure. We can like take, a, take people who are second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, look at their Y chromosomes and count up the number of differences and divide by how many generations separate them. And it's one to more than one, maybe three mutations per generation. And what's a mutation? It's just a spelling error, a letter change. And in 65 million letters, if you change one or, two million, one or two letters, it does nothing. I mean, big deal. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't affect us. But there are definitely differences, and we can see them, and that puts this into the biblical time frame. That's point number two. You okay so far? The third reason to believe in a biblical Adam is the fact that Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve actually exist. Now, they named mitochondrial Eve as a joke to poke fun at the Bible. They don't believe that Eve was the, uh, the first woman ever. They believe that there was a population of people and one woman, one woman just happens to be the ancestor of everyone alive today. Imagine this, ready? Imagine that the rest of the world is suddenly annihilated and only the people in this room survive. Now, we're a population, right? And we're going to go out and we're going to reconquer the world. But those first couple of generations is probably going to have a pretty high death rate, right? We're not going to have clothing manufacturers. And if someone breaks a shovel, you're not going to be able to fix the, we don't have foundries, right? We're going to have to rebuild civilization from scratch. A lot of us aren't going to make it. So our population is going to stay pretty small for a long time. But that means that everyone in this room, um, if you want to get married, you have to marry someone else in the room, and the next generation, everyone's going to be marrying cousins or brothers and sisters like Abraham. So your, your population is going to stay small for a long time. What's the chance that in 10 or 20 generations, everyone's going to have the last name of Yoder? It's pretty high. There's only one. Is any a Carter in the room? There's only one of me, right? No other Carters? So whatever the highest 
last, whoever has the most number of people in that last name, that's Y chromosomes. And the probability, probability tells us that whoever has the most Y chromosome in the beginning is probably going to win after a couple of generations. So the evolutionist says, oh, okay, if we had a population of about 10,000 individuals, just through dumb luck, given enough time and enough inbreeding that little population, one Y chromosome is going to arise. And one mitochondria is going to arise. And yet the Bible demands it. They discovered it and figured out a way to explain it after the fact with this Af- African bottleneck. But the Bible says, one man, one woman, and we see it. So I showed you the Y chromosome tree. I, I did a similar thing with mitochondria. This is a mitochondrial family tree. And again, there's so much cool stuff here. Here again, we have African specific lines on the right, Asians up here in the top, about four o'clock HVR. Uh, that's mainly Europeans. And boom, boom, boom. You can see who's related to whom. It's fascinating, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to dive a little deeper here. This is experimental. I'm struggling to explain this, but it's my best attempt. It's that the human Y chromosome and human mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Adam, and human mitochondrial Eve exist. Think about this. If we came from a common population that's split into humans and chimpanzees. That's what we're told, right? Well, in that population, you expect a diversity of Y chromosomes. Just like if we were a population, we split into two different groups of people. We'd be sharing Y chromosomes, right? So someone in that population could be more close related to someone in the other population than they could be to someone in their own population. Does that make sense? So some human could have a Y chromosome he shares with a chimpanzee and a human could be more closely to, closer to a chimpanzee than to another human. Ooh. Let me explain it this way. Here's our population. Let's say there's five Y chromosome lineages. And they can be traced back to some common ancestor sometime before that. Instead of six million years ago, maybe it's ten million years ago. Just making up a number. And that population splits into a human population and a chimpanzee population. And look, the same Y chromosomes are in both populations. And if you map it out like this, you realize that number one chimpanzee is closely related to number one in human. But number one in chimpanzee, you have to go way back 10 million years ago instead of 6 million years ago, 10 million years ago to find the common ancestor with number two. Now, you'd expect some lineages to get lost over time, so maybe something like this would appear. Imagine the sociological implications. If most humans had a very different Y chromosome, but some of them had a Y chromosome similar to chimpanzees. Now, imagine if those people were in Africa. Can you imagine how horrible that would be? I thank God this is not true. I praise God this is not true. Or imagine if Europeans were closer to monkeys than Africans. Then the script would flip, right? That would be horrible. I wouldn't want them to be in that position either way. Because, man, if someone is more closely related to a monkey, I think I'd probably treat him like one. But this is more likely. This is the evolutionary story. We have a human Y chromosome and a chimpanzee Y chromosome, they are very, very different from one another. They're like, well, half the chimpanzee Y chromosome is missing, but of the part that's similar, they're like 35% identical. They're radically different. And yet, looking at this, there's no evidence of any of these ever existing. It's as if this is true. That's the biblical story. The Y chromosome of human is different than the Y chromosome of chimpanzee. I'm very, very happy to report that. That did not have to be true. In evolutionary theory, this didn't have to be true. In the Bible, it had to be true. You okay with that? All right. Number four. Just basic human genetic diversity. There is not a lot of genetic diversity in this room. But even if you added people from Africa and China and some Native Americans and some Australian natives, there still wouldn't be a lot of genetic diversity in this room. In fact, ready? Um, Are any of you brothers and sisters front row here? No, good. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
That's 99% of the world's genetic diversity. Seven maybe, but probably six. That includes Africans. Almost all African DNA is sitting right here. If I had a bunch of Africans, I could look at them and say, hey, you know what? All the European genetics is right here. In fact, I'd only need five of them or maybe four of them because there's more diversity in Africa. What separates us? Almost nothing. There's one major letter change in one gene that produces this skin color. One letter. Africans carry that. Some of them. It's very rare to have an African that has two copies of that letter, though. Almost all of you, I know someone here, uh, at least one person here, doesn't clearly have pure European genetics, right? Not many. (laughs) But you European people are inbred. You carry two identical copies of that, of that gene, which means that your mother and your father were related. Ooh. Sorry, I'm not going to pick on red-haired people because I'm picking on my sisters. I'm not going to pick on blue-haired pe- uh, blue-eyed people, but those are all evidences of inbreeding. That is not brothers marrying sisters. It's small populations isolated from other populations, and when someone wants to find a mate, they can only find one locally. In fact, most people throughout human history have married someone who's born maybe five miles away from they were, where they were born. In fact, most people marry their cousin throughout history. Charles Darwin married his first cousin. And Charles Darwin's sister married her brother. And all of Charles Darwin's wives, brothers, and sisters all married first cousins. It's not smart to do that. In fact, in, in England today, the British Health Service um, they, they track birth defects. The majority of birth defects in England are coming from the Muslim community in England because cousin marriages is very, very common in that community. It might not be legal, but it's very common. And why would people do that? Because it keeps the land and the money in the family. A brother and a sister sit down and say, hey, look, your son marries my daughter, and the farm stays in the family name. That's why. And so it was control of finances that have have driven this throughout history. But that's one reason why these so-called races have developed is because people tend to only marry people who look and act and speak like them. Just putting that there for you. Now, here's Collins again. He says, there's no way you can develop this level of variation between us from one or two ancestors. He's saying, look at the diversity of people in the world. You can't start with Adam and Eve. There's no way. Or Dennis Venema, one of uh, uh, a a colleague of Collins. He's actually a professor at a Christian university in Canada. He said, to get the amount of genetic diversity that we see, you'd have to postulate that there's been this absolutely astronomical mutation rate that has produced all these new variants in an incredibly short period of time. Those types of mutation rates are just not possible. It would mutate us out of existence. Well, in one sense, he's right. If Adam and Eve had no genetic diversity and Eve was a clone of Adam, then every variant that we see in skin color, eye color, hair color, height, weight, intelligence, all the different genetics we have would have to be explained through mutation. But that's nonsense. Why would God not have put genetic variation into Adam himself? There's about 10 million places in our genomes that are in this room that differ from one another. I, my, in fact, I've had my entire genome sequenced. It cost $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. But Dante Labs in Italy had a, a Black Friday special a couple years ago. Guess how much it cost me to have my genome sequenced? $125. I've got it on a spare hard drive sitting in my backpack back there. If anyone looks at my DNA. But DNA sequencing now is cheap. And I know... I have about 3 million variants in my 3 billion letters where the letter I got from mom and the letter I got from dad are different. So all of you carry about 3 million places that differ. But in the room, there's about 10 total. But almost all those variants don't cause disease. They're beneficial. They're healthy. If God put them into Adam... And all we need is a normal process of people making babies and the DNA shuffling from one generation to the next, and they're here. 
I wrote about this in an article called The Non-Mythical Adam and Eve. I put these guys in their place. They made a ridiculous assumption. In fact, it is trivial to explain the genetic diversity in humans, starting with Adam and Eve. It's not a challenge. It's trivial. We can easily get all of what we see in the world from those two people. And then you add a few mutations that happen over time, like sickle cell anemia, which is real common in Central Africa. That's not an Adam trait. That's a mutation. But then so is blue eyes and so is red hair. And possibly this light skin color. I'm not exactly certain because it is found other places in the world other than Europe. But just saying. All you need is a little bit of mutation after the fact and it's easy. But it's not only the amount of variation. It's the distribution. When I looked at the, um, the mitochondria, I looked at the frequency of the letter differences amongst all these things, and I found a lot of really rare mutations in mitochondria. Now, if we started from Eve, then all of this is mutation. There's no genetic diversity in Eve. She's got one, one mitochondria. And if we inherited her mitochondria, what do we see? A lot of really rare things. In other words, things that popped up in one generation ago, two generations ago. They're found in one person. They're found in 10 people. They're found in a, a tribe. And then we find a few things that are in like 25, 30% of the population. Shem, Ham, and Japheth had three wives. Each one of them represented one-third of the world's mitochondrial diversity. And all of us descend from one of those three women on our family side. Those bumps out there around 30%, that's what I'd expect if we started with three women. The stuff all on, on, on the left side, the really rare stuff, that's because over the several thousand years, we picked up mutations. That's exactly the biblical picture I'd expect. Is that going over your head? Sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> but it's not only that. It's also the rest of the genome. That curve, I went to the thousand genomes uh, program data, and I downloaded a thousand human genomes, and I just looked at chromosome 22. I said, here's all the letters on chromosome 22. How frequently did we find them? We found a lot of them in 1% of the people, 2% of the people. Then it drops very quickly down to, you know, not many found in 5% of the people, and hardly anything out here in the 50% range. Now, hold it, hold it. If we started from Adam alone, like the Bible says, Adam has two chromosomes, two copies of chromosome one. So God could have engineered variation there. He could put an A on this one and a G on that one. That means 50-50, right? If half are an A and half are a G, that means that his children should have had half A and half G. That means that I'd expect a giant peak out here around 50% if we started from Adam and we don't see it. And that troubled us. I had a whole research team on this, and we we're like, oh no. Once, once I generated that curve, I thought, oh, that's not what I expected. What are we going to do? This looks like evolution. This looks like millions of years, slow mutation accumulation over time. So, what we did was we have a computer program, a very powerful computer program called Mendel's Accountant. And we ran an evolutionary model where we had like 100,000 people for 100,000 years, a normal mutation rate. We let chromosomes recombine, make children, and we got that curve. And oh, that's very similar. Ooh, we, we, were, we were struggling. And I said, okay, now let's run some creationist models. Let's take this evolutionary population, and 10,000 years ago, we're going to pull two people out. We'll call them Adam and Eve, and we'll kill off the rest of the people and had them restart the population. We call that the evolutionary Adam and Eve. And then we said, okay, let's take um, Adam alone and allow him to have some variation. And Eve is a clone of Adam, and we'll let them propagate. We call that the, um, the designed alleles model. And then we said, okay, let's say that Adam and Eve, their reproductive cells, God could have engineered a lot of different genomes into their reproductive cells. Right? We have to be born through the normal process, but Adam and Eve were created. He could have front-loaded their reproductive cells with a lot of genetic diversity. So the amount of genetic diversity we see in the world today might depend upon how many children Adam and Eve had. Oh, that's interesting. We call that the design gametes model. And when we plotted all these alternate models, they were all a better fit to the real data than the evolutionary model was. And we rejoiced. That, we were mistaken. We, didn't, we should not have expected a big peak at 50. That was a mistake. Because over time, 
Imagine that Adam had, um, you know, A's and G's, and he had 10 kids. Well, those A's and G's, some of the kids are going to be AA, and some of the kids are going to be GG. So that 50-50 line gets spread out, and the next generation gets spread out, and the next generation gets spread out, and it goes flat. Boom, that's what we saw. Is that too much for you? Sorry. If that's not too much for you, go look up my paper. Go to creation.com, type in... Adam and Eve and Diversity Carter, and you'll find a link to that paper. That was a lot of fun, and it's amazing. Okay, shifting gears. <gasps> Let's go easy. Another reason to believe in the biblical Adam is because of the irregular mutation rates we see in the data. The evolutionists require something called a molecular clock. Mutations have to happen at the same rate in all populations at all time. And if there's not a clock... You can't put a date on anything. Because if the mutations aren't appearing at the same rate, what if the mutations are faster in some populations than others? That can't, it can't be true. It must be a clock. But you've already seen it. Did you notice that every once in a while there's a person sticking way out of the tree? That means that they picked up more mutations than their cousins since the same common ancestor. Therefore, when I look at these people, um, the evolutionary model, the reason they say out of Africa, because if you take the furthest person on the right and the first person on the left, the average is about here, which is in Africa. That's why they say out of Africa. They take the midpoint. But what if mutations don't happen at the same rate? I already said that these are the pygmies and the Khoisan Bushmen tiny little inbred populations living in a marginal environment with very fast mutation rates because the death rates are really high when you're living in the presence of lions. So these are the odd populations, the weird populations. These are the outliers. And the entire out-of-Africa model is based upon the outliers. While the rest of the world looks like it all goes back to a common ancestor around here. This is Noah. Because it's not Y chromosome Adam. Our Y chromosome ancestor is Noah. We don't know what Adam's Y chromosome looked like. It's been lost. Because if any mutations happen between Adam and Noah, we don't have these, we only have Noah's. Can you look at the mitochondria? Look at these. You see these people way out here? And their cousins are here. That means the same amount of mutation, the same amount of time, but these people have half the number of mutations as these people. Or look in Europe from this common ancestor that formed probably 70% of Europeans go back to one woman. That's interesting. But from that one woman, some people have twice as many mutations as others. Or go back a little further in time to maybe one of Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives. All the Europeans have half the number of mutations as the people in groups U, K, and F. They have more mutations. I'm beating a dead horse here. It's clear. The mutation rates aren't constant. There is no molecular clock. Therefore, you cannot put a date on, on mitochondrial Eve or Y chromosome Adam. And they don't want you to know that. And as I said earlier, when we look at the real world mutation rates, it's also true for mitochondria. There's about one mutation every other, maybe every third generation. And that means that all this information easily fits in 6,000 years. Easily. That's not a challenge. We can also look at the, um, the lifespans of the patriarchs after the flood. They follow a very mathematical progression. It's really interesting. So yeah, Noah might have lived a long time, but Shem didn't, and Arphaxad didn't. As you get down towards Abraham's time, didn't. But then you can get outside of Genesis 11, and you can go all the way down to, I think this is uh, King Manasseh. The last person in the Bible that we have a straight, a, straight genie, a straight generation count, and we know how old he was when he died, and he didn't die in battle. King Manasseh. And his follows this beautiful mathematical curve. Ancient people weren't drawing biological decay curves. And this information isn't found in one place in the Bible. You might have Genesis 11, it goes to about here and stops. All these other data, this is Moses, Miriam, um, Moses' father and grandfather, Levi, and all these other random people 
we have their lifespan and the generation count, and it follows this beautiful curve. The mathematical nature of this supports the veracity of the biblical text. Because if you were going to make it up, you wouldn't be able to do that. Because ancient people didn't have Excel. They couldn't draw graphs. But not only that, if you were a very old man and you had a child, because the male reproductive cells start dividing at puberty and they don't stop dividing until the male dies, the older the man is when he has a child, the more generations his little cells have gone through, the more mutations they have picked up. We can measure that. We've seen it uh, in, in family trees. Older fathers produce children with more mutation than younger fathers. Whoa. And if you take a mathematical model of that, like I did, you get something like this. This is the estimated, my estimated mutation rate, average, per year after the flood. Now, this is average. Just because, you know, this man is like maybe 600 years old and he has a son, that doesn't mean that there's another man who's only 20 years old who just had a son. So what, we're, what I'm saying is this. When you look at these trees and these branches, these branches aren't time. It's age of the father. So we would expect, in a biblical pattern, huge, massive branches to form very early. And that, in fact, is what we see. Just because of mutations that happen from really old people. Okay, let's make this easy. All the complicated stuff's out of the way. Number seven. The real reason to believe in the biblical Adam is that the Bible says that Adam was real. And that should be enough. But some nerds like me, I need confirmation. I need, I need to take things in the world and answer them because I don't like having hanging answers. I like to answer things. But the Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. That is a historical statement of fact. And as you just learned from this, my six evidences, science supports this. But if that is true, if all people on earth are descendants of Adam and no one else. Now, this is a challenge because when Europeans started exploring the world, they ran into people who looked a lot different than them. They ran into people who were culturally inferior to them, they thought. And they struggled. Why is it Native Americans have sticks and stones and bows and arrows? And Europeans had cathedrals and universities and large ships. Maybe they came from a different stock. Maybe God created different groups of people. The entire African slave trade in America and, and the Americas was driven by the thought that Africans were different than Europeans. They couldn't be the same. They couldn't be equal. They couldn't be as smart as us. No way. The idea of polygenesis, multiple creations, was driving that. And that's one of the ways that even the theologians supported the slave trade was because they thought that Africans were beneath the Europeans. And isn't it clear? Now, when they started discovering all the mound-building technologies in America, they didn't know what to do with it. And this is where the Book of Mormon comes from, a false history of the supposed uh, ancient Indians who descended from the Jews and things like that. No, none of that's true. But this is people in the 1800s struggling to say, how could Native Americans have been advanced in the past and they're not today? Well, the answer is that when Columbus discovered the New World, something like 95% of Native Americans died of diseases. Imagine what would happen to your community if 95% of you died of diseases. Imagine what happened to the world if 95% of the people died of disease. Your culture would collapse and you would revert to a very primitive existence. That's what happened. And the bigotry of the Europeans, when they started coming over here in droves, they said, look at these people. There's this huge un unlived land. There's nothing here. And now we're like radar imaging the Amazon River, the Amazon Basin. We realize that the Amerindians had geoengineered the Amazon basin. You know, those people with the loincloths who hunt with, with spears were superior engineers in the past. In Scripture, look at Colossians 3.11. Here there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. 
You know, I thank God for that because um, when God says he's going to send a kinsman redeemer, that makes no sense to me, the European, because I'm not Jewish. A redeemer will come to Zion, Isaiah 59 says, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Uh, I have no hope of redemption because I'm not in Jacob, right? But 1 Corinthians 15 says, this, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Oh, Christ isn't related to me through Jacob. I have no Jewish blood. He's related to me through Adam. Consider that there were places in Europe that weren't Christianized until 1200 A.D., That'd be Lithuania. And the only reason it was Christianized because the Eastern Church and the Western Church were fighting over it, and they forced converted the people. Iceland wasn't Christianized until 1,000 A.D., 1,000 years after Christ before those per- people first heard the gospel. You Europeans, you're Johnny-come-lately. Where's the first place outside of Israel that the gospel went? I'll give you a hint. Philip and the Ethiopian. On his way to Africa, he got saved and baptized. So Africa has a deeper history of Christianity than Europe does. Why am I saying that? Because Christ, in Ephesians 2, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, had been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh a dividing wall of hostility. And thanks be to God, because I don't deserve to be in that group, because I'm not Jewish. And I think most of you aren't Jewish either. You understand what I'm saying here? The importance of Adam is directly uh, reflected in the importance of salvation. And if it wasn't for a real, historical, verifiable Adam, who is the ancestor of everyone alive today, and no one else, there's no people outside the garden. No, we all come from Adam and Adam alone. If it wasn't for that, then salvation would be very difficult to preach to someone like me. I look at my ancestors. Have you looked at European history? Those people were gross. They were awful. They were the most wicked people on the planet. Especially when you get into the the pre-Roman times, they were barbarians, and it's awful. And that's me. That's my stock. But why am I like the way I am now? It's only because of the transforming work of Christ and Christ alone. Because he sought out me like him who's the descendant of Adam. Hey, did you know that science goes theological really quickly? Sure does. Um, you find a lot more in Creation Magazine. Tonight, we'll do it tonight. Tonight, I'm going to pass around while we're sitting here. Sign up for Creation Magazine. I'm going to skip it now because I, I went a little long because, you know, I'm really enjoying this topic. Um, I'll point you to, out to a couple of things. You can hear a very similar version of this talk on our website, The Historical Atom, Theological Conundrums and Scientific Implications. If you go to creation.com, type on, click on Media, and type in something like Y chromosome or Historical Atom. You can watch it for free, and we'll share it with somebody else. I have a, a DVD on the table there, brand new. Ancient DNA, Illuminating the Tapestry of Biblical Human History. This is talking about ancient history that we're digging up in graves and sequencing DNA out of ancient people. And it's amazing what we're learning. Now, a lot of people don't have DVD players. My computer, I have no DVD, way to play DVDs. But these new DVDs, um, most people have cell phones, hover over the QR code on the DVD. It'll go to our web store, automatically edit for free. And you can watch it on your computer, your phone, your tablet, any kind of electronic gizmo that you might have. That's there for you. Here's Evolution's Achilles Heels. It talks a lot about these things. Uh, powerful information in that book and that, that movie that we made. Consider also... Christianity for skeptics. A lot of what we're talking about today is directly aimed at the people who are skeptical and aggressively skeptical against Christianity. That book has some fascinating and amazing helps to get us over some of the humps that we might be wrestling with or tell us how we can talk to other people when they're skeptical. And I'm going to leave you with this. 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet would do it with gentleness and respect. And I hope you can follow that. I tried to not be snarky. I really did.
It's in my blood to do that. I have to force myself to follow this because harsh and sarcastic facts shouted in anger usually don't point people toward the cross. Just saying. All right, we're going to, um, I'm going to actually make an executive decision here. We're going to forego the Q&A that we might have done after this because it's 1230 and our stomachs are going to be growling soon, right? And I'm going to be around out there. We could talk all we want. In fact, I want to run out there and take another measurement on my little gizmo and write it down. If you want to help track the sun through the sky today, there's a machine out there, and a lot of people have done it, and I will help you. We'll measure the position of the, of the sun. And on Monday night, I'm going to graph it on the screen to see how well we did. That machine there is showing us that the earth is round. Just saying. All right. Um, do we have any announcements we had to make? Yes, no? Yes? All right, come on up. Yes, no? All right. Thank you all much. Um, you have a great afternoon.